Ancestry with Verneri Pujola. Yeah. Like this amazing, you know, trumpet player. And uh, uh, I just wanted to. Yeah. No, but I, I wanted to start, like I said, uh, before I listened to the last album, Ancestry with Verneri Pujola. And uh, it's such a beautiful addition to your trio, the trumpet. And uh, I just wanted to start uh, by asking you, how did this collaboration happen? And why him, first of all? I mean, Kind of makes sense musically when I listen to it now, but how did all this happen? So, mm -hmm. uh, okay, why why I why I invited him? Um, yeah, I heard him play like several years ago at uh, at Jazz Ahead, and I just you know thought he sounded <laughs> amazing, and uh, so we talked, and uh, and I tried to put together a project. Um, I can't remember exactly what year this is. This is like eight, nine years ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was trying to get funding from uh, like this uh, uh, Nordic uh, uh, grant um, fund to uh, to to collaborate, and uh, I didn't get the funding, so the uh, the project just fell through. But I kept running into him, like, <laughs> it was just like, oh, he would be there. We'd be like, oh, hey, how are you? And like, yeah, we should play. And, you know, it was always like this reminder that we meant to do something that didn't work out. And uh, so when I uh, got invited to uh, come to uh, Tampere, just happening, um, this festival in, uh, mm -hmm. in the city of Tampere, I just thought, wow, this is, this is the opportunity that we've been given, you know, invited to come to Finland, and uh, now is the chance to uh, to connect with uh, Verneri and 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 play together. And uh, so I asked the festival if it would be okay to invite mm. him to join us, and uh, and they were really happy about it. Uh, I didn't know, but uh, they were about to uh, present him with an award at the festival. So it was oh, just, okay. you know, it was perfect timing. <laughs> So we met there and, and rehearsed and, and, and um, everybody wrote some music and we played together. And then we, after the festival, we went to a, a studio uh, near Helsinki to the uh, Sibelius Academy. They have a mm -hmm. studio and recorded. And uh, yeah, it was just so nice. <laughs> oh, wow. did, did you guys then perform this music live also later or a little bit or not? Yeah. You did? Yeah. Oh, okay. oh, yeah. Yeah. A little bit, and we just uh, like I made. Uh, it's the first time I made vinyl, and ah, okay. uh, I had just gotten the vinyl um, like at the end of uh, 2019. And we did a little tour in Finland in, in January 2020, oh, and nice. then yeah, something happened that we didn't <laughs> tour <laughs> again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It's yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Bizarre times. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, no, but it's a it's a beautiful how, how you know you played with your trio for such a long time and he just blends in like really naturally. It's a beautiful, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, he, beautiful. Thing. He's just also such a such a warm and uh, beautiful person. So yeah, yeah. Uh, this, speaking of your trio and this record, you know, I listen to all, all these tunes like Atlantic Lullaby and February and all these tunes you wrote are so beautiful. And even before your albums, like, you know, you have such beautiful melodies always. And uh, thank you. kind of following this Scandinavian, even not, I mean, yeah, I guess I would call it like this, you know, this, it's something you guys have. I don't know, what is it? This uh, <laughs> mellowness or, you know, this character of music. And, but I wanted to ask you, how did you approach writing for this album? the music, thinking of Werner, you probably on trumpet. Yeah. Uh, or in general, also how yeah. do you approach usually writing? Like, do you just improvise or have sketches or like? Yeah, I just, uh, I normally just try to uh, 
put myself into a mood, you know, like sort of just thinking, okay, this is going to be with him, you know, and uh, it's weird. It's, it's not like I have a step-by-step -step guide to how I write to a quartet. I just, in general, whatever project I'm doing, I just try to sort of mentally put myself into this mood of what I want it to be and see what happens. Mm. And uh, yeah. So. <laughs> but uh, I mean, are you like, you know, many musicians I've spoken to, many of them are like, they need a deadline to oh, write music. Yeah, deadlines are good. <laughs> and no, I, I don't need bunch to of write music. Ah, okay, okay. I, no, but just in in sort of finishing a project, like now I have a bunch of music that I could record, and uh, and I'm kind of dragging my feet, like you know I should just book a recording session and decide let's go record this now, you know. But writing music is um, it makes me feel good. So if I yeah. have the um, free time, I, I really enjoy uh, just trying to write something and. Uh, and it's it's very rewarding. It's kind of like meditating, you know. Yeah. It's a yoga session, you know. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, I'm the same. I also have write, yeah. have written so many compositions, not even knowing whether they will be recorded or not. Just just to yeah. have it, you know, like this, like you said, Zen moment of spending time with the instrument and like. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Figuring out what to do or where to go in this, it's like a game sometimes. You have the A section, and then it's like, okay, do we need something else or not? Or maybe keep it simple or... Uh, yeah, and sometimes nothing else comes that matches what you have. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah, I hate that kind of... <laughs> well, what about the, me me the melodicism of your playing? Where, where does this come from? I mean, especially of your compositions, there's always these beautiful mm. melodies. Uh, mm. Well, I, I, I'm really drawn to melodies and to harmony. I really love, awesome, yeah. um, just, uh, I've always found uh, like uh, harmony to be really interesting and fascinating. And I love just great uh, chord progressions, you know, just uh, really uh, connect with them. Yeah. And um, melody, yeah, I love melodies. I always kind of listen for the melodic aspects of music rather than uh, technical abilities or, um, you know, uh, difficulties in rhythms. I'm yeah. just more fascinated by, by melodies. And I don't know if it has uh, something to do with, you know, growing up in, in, in the Nordics, you know, <laughs> In, in the Nordic countries, like we, a lot of uh, there's a lot of singing traditions. Uh, when we're children, we sing a lot of folk songs, and uh, and there's a lot of music in the environment. So uh, maybe that's just something that sort of um, seeps in and mm. uh, just naturally comes out when you're uh, trying to create music. You know. Yeah, um, I mean, growing up in Iceland. What was the first, you, you know, I have to be honest, I have no idea about the jazz scene in Iceland. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I, I know about the New York, the European, the Berlin, the kind of, but the, in Iceland, I'm completely blank. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I know Hilmar Jensen yeah. and you and uh, uh, Mikael Asmundsson, the guitarist also, and some uh -huh. others. Yeah, and, yeah. But yeah. like, how was it for you growing up in Iceland and getting this first? Uh, what was the first jazz exposure? To yeah, jazz. exposure. yeah. Well, what, how did that happen? You remember? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think uh, I just uh, I would hear uh, jazz on television at the uh, end of the. There was actually an end of the program, like in the evening, where the <laughs> where the TV would shut down. And uh, so at the end of the, the program, they would play um, some uh, jazz music like Oscar Peterson or Bill Evans. And, and really? have oh. this, uh, like a still image of a beautiful mountain or lake or something, you know, and that was sort of like the end of the TV broadcast for that day. And I was just always drawn to this music, 
I just liked it. Something, uh, something about it just grabbed me. You know, I didn't know anybody like around me that listened to jazz. Mm. My father listened to a lot of classical music, and my mother listened to uh, well, some Ella Fitzgerald, but Judy Garland, and more sort of show type kind of music. Mm. But, but so then when I uh, went to uh, the music school to study jazz, and then I got more introduced into the like the local jazz scene, and there were quite a few uh, guys here playing um, standards and bebop and, and more of the traditional or mainstream kind of jazz. And, uh, but still like the atmosphere, you know, it's the, the energy so great, you know, going to little clubs and, and hearing people play yeah. this music. I, I don't think it really matters whether it's your original stuff or, or, oh, sure. or standards or bebop, whatever, but there's like this, you know, this energy that is just really uh, awesome, you know. Yeah. So that was really my uh, my sort of introduction into jazz. Oh, and, but uh, but in uh, in Iceland was it like you know already jazz happening before like fifties or forties like? Yeah, I, I mean it used to be the kind of the popular music of its time. Also, okay. You know? So we had these little. Uh, you know, groups with, with vocalists that would play okay. for dance, you know. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so there's been a tradition of, of jazz in Iceland for a long time. And um, a lot of um, players from Denmark would come here. They had a really close relationship yeah. with Denmark. Wow. And, uh, yeah. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, I didn't did know. I, I, I was like, I have to ask you this because, <laughs> you know, you're the yeah. source there. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But you mentioned then st studying jazz, and you you know you went to the states then, right? To yeah. How did this decision happen? And uh, <laughs> yeah, what, yeah. Can you tell me the story you know, behind that? Yeah. How how does a girl from Iceland like get the idea to go to the U.S. and study jazz? I mean, that's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, finishing my uh, my education here. Like uh, we finish uh, uh, school around uh, like age 20. I'd finished mm -hmm. my, uh, my college studies and I thought I would go to the university and become an engineer. And oh, I really wow. loved math. Oh, wow. Math was my okay. favorite subject. So I started, you know, working. Uh, I started uh, studying math a little bit at the university, but I was at the time I was working in the building industry. I was putting uh, iron reinforcement into buildings before they would pour the concrete in. Oh and, man, okay. Yeah, I wow. know. But, uh, and then when I started, you know, at, at the university, I just found it like less interesting, I guess, than I had expected. And I sort of lost interest in pursuing this uh, route of becoming a, an engineer. And uh, so I just, I, I quit and I just, for a while, I just had no idea what I wanted to do, but I was always playing that I would do my, you know, continuing or higher studies in mm. music or even become a musician. You know, it just, it was sort of like, at the end, I'm like, well, oh, well, I guess I'm just gonna, you know, go to the US and study jazz, you know? And <laughs> so that's basically what happened. And then once I was there, you know, I'm like uh, yeah. in this environment, like just outside New York, went to school just outside New York and, and everybody's playing gigs, like all my, uh, my fellow students, you know, playing little gigs here and there. And, and I was just like, oh, well, this is cool. Maybe I'll do that too. And, and I just sort of followed in the footsteps of others, you know, oh, it was fun. You know? How was this first reaction when you came there? I mean, did you go also to New York to see people on concerts and gigs? And like, how was this experience? The yeah. New York experience? Oh, like the so first... amazing, you know, just, gosh, for me to come there. And uh, there was one place called Bradley's. Yeah. I don't think oh, it's yeah. there anymore. It was a really small club. Yeah. And they had um, either solo piano or duos. Duo, and yeah, I would go nice. and sit like uh, one meter away from Mulgrew Miller or Kenny Barron and just Oof. be like, oh my God. <laughs> you yeah, know, exactly. it was so amazing. And I would, uh, at this time, I had a, you know, a cassette player, like uh, it was called, what, a mini disco, I think. <laughs> and yeah. I would just have it in my pocket 
and I would record their gigs and then I would go home and listen to it and try to pick up what they were doing. And yeah, it was so inspiring. So amazing, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I remember that because for me, it's just, you know, coming from Slovenia, I live in a town of 150,000 people and I went to New York for the first time when I was 19. And for me, it was just like, you know, seeing, I don't know, Kenny Barron also and John Schofield live yeah, and yeah. Chick Corea and everyone. I was just like, oh, right. really? And you see, you know, like that yeah. all about guides for concerts and it's like every day, 40 concerts listed and I was just like, really? yeah, you know, right. Was, and that's, you know, you know, when I, when I, after I finished school and I moved to Brooklyn and I remember we would maybe go to the Vanguard and see the first set. And then when that was over, we would walk over to uh, this other place, uh, Detour. Oh, yeah. A lot of people would play yeah. and we would hang out there and then go to the scene node and we would like hang out there a little bit. So you would like see like maybe three, four bands in one evening before going back home, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's yeah, incredible. That, how did you yeah. then decide to when you were in New York? I mean, I mentioned Mindful before. Uh, uh -huh. How did you decide to become a band leader? Then where where, where does this this trigger come from? And uh, mm. started writing music. Yeah. And... Good question. Well, I had uh, I had written music like since I was a kid, basically. I uh -huh. uh, wrote like little, you know, little tunes and, and um, so it wasn't really new to me, but I think I did stop for a while because uh, I mean, writing a pop tune was something easy and then I just got, you know, sidetracked, I think, trying to learn how to improvise and, and all that. Yeah. And then, you know, in, eventually got back into it. Probably just because that's what everybody else was doing. You know, people that were, were going to school with me, they were writing music. So I'm like, yeah, maybe I should do that again. You know, just, you know, get back into writing music. But I think, you know, becoming a band leader, it's funny because I did a, uh, I was on a panel yesterday about uh, gender issues in jazz. Oh, okay. And one of the things I brought up is that uh, typically women in jazz tend to be band leaders. And uh, I don't know, we, we can speculate why that is. And I, I think uh, it, it has, there's uh, some sort of social connotation to it. Like uh, when a guy gets a gig, he calls his guy friends, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you, as a woman, want to become a part of the jazz scene, you really just need to uh, create your opportunities carve your space and go for it you know so that often means you've got to be the band leader you've got to book the gigs and, and and do that stuff you know that just to to be a part of it you know yeah and when i was in new york there weren't many women there were side men you know i think oh, Linda yeah. o was was there you know and now she's sort of become known as a both a band leader and a great side man you know but typically women were band leaders yeah. You know, so. Yeah, especially I'm, I, when you were saying this, I'm, I'm thinking now, uh, especially about piano, female piano players. Like, I mean, I know Chris Davis now; she's really active. But, like, thinking about the time around 2000. Uh, uh huh. But yeah. she also started out as a band leader. She was in yeah, exactly. New York yeah. when I was there. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and so I think that's some sort of. Uh, a so social reason for it you know it's not like right, a yeah. a planned out thing you know it's just kind of how how things are at the moment <laughs> yeah was it hard for you becoming a band leader how, how was that experience you know because on that first you know you had drew grass and mm -hmm. tony and scott like mm -hmm. but how, how did that group form and how was it for you to mm -hmm. lead those guys you know i, I you know yeah. it, <laughs> I remember me when I was a young band leader and, you know, like your unexperienced, but especially for you being a woman then, since you mentioned it also and leading all mm -hmm. this, Drew was already like a quite a big name already back then in jazz and Tony yeah, also. Right. Becoming a, how was that experience for you like? Well, I think it's just uh, important to, to work with, uh, yeah, it's important to work with nice people, you know, and uh, I've definitely had uh, issues with uh, side men like having a, having a problem with the fact that I'm a woman telling them what to do, you know, mm, wow. even though it's just like, 
telling them how I would like the form of the tune to go or whatever. They somehow resent it, you know, really? but, you know, but fortunately I've just picked, I think generally people that are easy to work with. And, uh, and of course, like when you're going on the road and you're going to spend so much time with somebody, you just, it has to be somebody you can get along with and, and respect, you know? So, um, yeah, it's definitely been uh, something to be aware of, uh, but I feel that I've had a uh, good fortune to uh, most of the time have just really, really great people working people. with me. Yeah. How did you hook up with Drew, by the way? You know. With Drew and Tony, how, how did you meet those guys? Yeah, uh, uh, I can't remember how I met Tony. I think Scott was playing with Tony a little bit. Tony used to go to the same school that we went to, but he had already graduated when we got there, but we sort of heard about him. And and um, and Drew, of course, was like a big name. And I would go see him play with uh, Fred Hirsch and uh, yeah. and different different guys. But I got this one, uh, I had got a gig in in, uh, in New York at a restaurant that paid really well. <laughs> and and it was sort of like, wow, great. I can uh, I can just call anybody really for this gig. So I called Drew Grass and he agreed to come do the gig and, uh, and we're just playing standards, you know, at a restaurant and, uh, and it was great. And then we continued playing. I also got Dennis Irwin to come and do that gig. Oh, really? So oh, it was like, wow. Like, so there was like a nice opportunity to uh, sort of meet people or approach people that I, you know, weren't really on the same sort of session scene. But, you know, that's another thing with, with, with Malaby that uh, uh, he would come out to Brooklyn a lot and people would just do sessions. Yeah. You know, we'd meet at somebody's house and, and people were always into playing uh, sessions and meeting new people. And um, so that was a really nice environment and, and a great way to meet people. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing about New York. Basically, you play with musicians all the time. So it's, yeah. uh, I mean, at the highest level of musicians. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what about Lauren? I mean, uh, Mm -hmm. how, how did you hook up with Lauren then? I mean, because I played with Lauren quite some time also, and you, you play, we played with many same people, so that's why I'm asking yeah. how, how did the story with Lauren then. <laughs> Lauren, how did I meet Lauren? Um, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know where I met him. He wasn't scene. living in Brooklyn. I think he was living somewhere. Uh, my dog is here making noise. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, I can't remember how I met him. Probably just heard about him from somebody and or maybe Scott played a session with him and told me about him. Yeah, I really can't remember. Mm. Yeah. But we did play a lot for, for quite some time. Yeah, yeah, that's why I love that group also with Ivan, um, beautiful. Uh, yeah. yeah. Nice quartet. Well, you, you mentioned all these sessions in New York and uh, you then returned to Iceland. Uh, Mm -hmm. First of all, why the decision? I mean, when I speak to New York musicians now with the friends, you know, we have, I mean, the quality of living that we, I have, we have in Slovenia, it's quite high. And, you yeah. know, always many times in New York, you need, well, way more finances to live on a, you know, especially New York on a high quality of life. But what was the decision of you returning to Iceland? And mm -hmm. when now back in Iceland, do you miss those moments like those sessions and how did you adjust basically going back to Iceland from New York from that chaos to the <laughs> tranquility or yeah um it's exactly as you say the uh, the quality of life just uh I I realized that it wasn't going to get much better I was working all the time and still just yeah. barely making enough to pay the rent and at that time uh we didn't have access to health care or health insurance, you know, so wow. I was thinking, well, if something happens as we get older, and we get, you know, if we get sick, then, uh, yeah, it's going to be really difficult with no family around, and uh, both the, me and my husband wanted to have children, and just felt that this would be very difficult to do in yeah. New York, although we had a very nice uh, rent-controlled apartment, and, and, and I liked living there, you know, but at a certain point, I just felt like I would 
need more uh, security, security and quality yeah. in life, you know. So we decided to move back to Iceland. And, uh, and it was quite a shock, really, to come back. And uh, Iceland had changed a lot. I'd been gone for 12 years. Oh, and of wow. course, for my husband, who was American, to suddenly, you know, come to Iceland, learn a new language and, and uh, everything. It, it, was, uh, it was not easy. Uh, and we did really miss uh, our friends and, and the energy of New York and, and the session scene, you know, that yeah. was very rewarding to uh, always be playing sessions and, uh, and lots of gigs. So, you know, but eventually we felt that we had, like you say, a better quality of life here and uh, still, you know, miss, miss the sessions, you know, <laughs> miss some of the, I don't know, like just miss some of Brooklyn and New York, you know, but I still, I, I'm glad that I left. Yeah. I uh, wouldn't want to, live there right now you know? oh yes sure and so when i when i do come back for a visit and we're like you know get stuck in traffic trying to get to the tunnel that's like oh, yeah yep that's why i left you know one of the reasons you know spent so much time being stuck in traffic trying to get to the gig and uh yeah so, i know yeah, yeah. Great, yeah. Place, great place to be when you're young you know and, and you I agree of, uh, a growing musician or artist and then I think it's good to leave yeah yeah I agree but mm. when you came back to back to Iceland you, you formed your trio and yeah you've, you've had this trio now for quite a long time right uh, yeah and uh I wanted to ask you uh, the bass player moved here like a year later oh wow Sorry. okay yeah no, no I, I wanted to ask you like basically you playing with the same trio mm -hmm. How do you keep it fresh and how do you make it interesting for you guys? Or what are the advantages of, I mean, obviously we know what they are, but what are the disadvantages and advantages if you see having the same band? Uh, mm -hmm. How would you look at yeah. the development also of this trio in, in your eyes and years? Right. Um, yeah, I think um, maybe the disadvantage when, when I was forming the trio is that there were, you know, maybe a handful of bass players and you're trying to pick someone that would sort of, that I felt that it would, would fit well with my music, what I wanted to do and also be able to, uh, you know, write for the, for the trio and, yeah. and be a, a, a part of it. And uh, uh, so when um, Turkey was, uh, studying in in Holland and and came back here after his studies a year later then uh, a year after we moved and we started playing together and uh, and it just felt good and and uh, he's like a super nice person you know so like I mentioned before it's important to yeah. uh, be working with nice people that you feel comfortable with and I think so the advantage that we have of having played together for so long is that we uh, really know each other well and, and there's a trust and understanding uh, that, you know, if you want to, if you feel like trying something out, you know, in the music, you know, if I, yeah. I want to like do something, I know they're there and they will just follow me. And, and uh, so there's a comfort level of uh, always playing with the same people. But yeah. then maybe you need to find a different uh, way of sort of challenging yourself and, uh, um, and I think we've managed to do that through our writing, you know, just trying to write something that will bring something new to the trio, you know, without losing our identity, yeah. you know. So yeah. I think it's uh, it's actually quite nice to to have a, just to have a band that's together for a long time. Yeah, no, I agree. But you also added Vernery on trumpet, yeah. which is again another herb for flavor to the band so yeah is there something that you consider doing also in the future of adding some guests or, or yeah i i liked it it was really nice to have uh venery join us i mean he just fitted so well with our with everything we were doing yeah. our sense of humor and and just everything it was just so easy and um, but the, yeah that was also nice just to have this additional new element something sort of to push us a little bit yeah. and 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 uh and keep us on our toes because there's a new guy 
guy here now. And uh, yeah, I would I would love to uh, do more of that in the future. Uh, I don't have any anyone particular in mind. I would also like to work more with Venery because uh, yeah, sure. we've had a great time so far. And, uh, yeah, the, and this this last album you did it also on your own, right? Your own label. And uh, uh, yeah, all all of them, all, all, all of my them. Albums. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that all of them. Oh, no, I, I just I want okay. So yeah, I mean I have my own label as well. So. But nowadays it's easier in a way, right? We have Bandcamp, we have all these different platforms, so it's yeah. kind of easier to network. But when you started with your own label, first of all, why the decision to do it? I mean, mm-hmm. of, to have control over the music, that's one big factor. But how do you see, what are the problems you encountered or you still do nowadays being located yeah. in Iceland, trying to spread the music and the, how, how does this work for you or has worked for you? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I did shop mindful a little bit to different labels and, and I had some interest, but nobody really wanted to commit to it at that time. There was um, a bit of uh, um, some sort of uh, the labels were having difficulties at that time. And uh, so instead of like waiting, like I, I just gave up on shopping it around. I think it was yeah. like a year old when I decided I'm just going to release it, you know. And CD Baby was starting up. Yeah. It was a new company back then, and we could distribute through them. And uh, so that's just what we did. Uh, and uh, and now, uh, yeah, I feel like with, you know, I think Spotify is sort of uh, standard yeah. for us, you know. Mm-mm. Because it's, it's difficult to always be uh, putting out new music if you uh, don't have the income from selling the uh, the CDs or selling the music, exactly. Yeah. And uh, uh, but yeah, Bandcamp is great, and I had the the good fortune to uh, uh, build a mailing list, like from the very beginning. So I still have. Um, I feel like I have loyal customers. You know, people that just buy everything I put out. Oh, that's so. Important. And that's uh, very nice. You know, and uh, and it was sort of a. A reminder the other day when, when Facebook got shut down and Instagram shut down and everything shut down, I was just like, you know, I should keep keep on building my mailing list, you know, because this this may go away, you know. Yeah, sure. Like, and then we have nothing because we're just putting like all our faith into this, this company, yeah. you know. True. Uh, yeah. True, I agree. But it, you also organized then your own tours when you went to Europe yep. and stuff. Wow. Yes, I have worked with with people in in certain countries. Like when I was playing um, in the Czech Republic, I had uh, a guy like booking the Czech mm-hmm. Republic gigs for us, okay. and also when we played in uh, England, uh, one 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 year we had I had somebody that just arranged a handful of gigs in England and then I took care of booking the rest of the tour and uh, I would love to have somebody do it for me and uh, don't we all right because then we would have more time working on the music but I guess I just haven't haven't met the right person yet (laughs) that's a good yeah I agree no but the so just one question for the future. What you said you wanted to continue playing also with Werneri, and but what, what are the plans for the next album? Or uh, because Ancestry has been like yeah. what two, 2018, right? Yeah, I know. It seems like it seems we had just started touring with the project when uh, when yeah. COVID kind of shut us down. Um, I was pl- my next plan is to uh, record the trio here in okay. Iceland, and I think uh, that idea just came from uh, being, you know, uh, restricted really to be being in Iceland and not being able to travel. And yeah. now that it's opening up again, I, I think I still might just want to uh, do the trio, and then maybe the next one after that will be uh, something else. You know, but I'm also working on some other projects. Like uh, I have a duo with a German pianist, Julia Hülsmann. Oh, really? And, oh, uh, wow! Really? Yeah. So that's so much fun. You know. How did this two, happen? Two grand pianists. <laughs> how did this happen? Uh, how did this happen? 
Well, I saw her or first met her uh, also at Jazz Ahead. It's funny, I met Werner at Jazz Ahead. And Julia Hilsman was on ECM yeah. record. So I had noticed her just because, oh, there's a, a woman pianist band leader on ECM and I was checking out her music and wow, is this like, she's great. Yeah. And I saw her just not playing, just hanging out at Jazz Ahead. So I decided to go up to her and say hi and just introduce myself. And then uh, maybe a year later, the embassy, the Icelandic embassy in Berlin asked if I could uh, do an event in Berlin. And uh, they didn't have the funding to bring my trio out. So I was, well, hey, Julia lives in Berlin. Why don't we do uh, two pianos, mm. uh, two women? And they just loved it. So we, <laughs> so we did this concert and it was, and again, it was great. Like, you know, I came to, um, Berlin, she had sent me some of her music, I sent her mine. We met and sort of ran through it and decided how to do it. And then we played and it was just so much fun. We had such good energy between us. Yeah, that's beautiful. And uh, since then we've been uh, just welcoming every opportunity to play together. Anybody that has two grand pianos, you know. So uh, trying to trying to do more of that now. Will you record this do also or? Mm, or plans or no plans to record not yet no but there's a there's a concert on on youtube i just put it for the day i oh, really so, have to uh, check it out okay super cool i'll yeah. check it out great nice looking forward to that cool thanks so much yeah. for sharing some thoughts hey, thank uh, you man about composing and <laughs> thank everything you. So. And hope to see you hey. around somewhere on the continent. Yeah. <laughs> Here, so. Jazz. Hawker Jazz.